are listening to The Itch, a podcast exploring all things allergy, asthma, and immunology. I'm your co-host, Courtney, a real-life allergy, asthma, and eczema girl. And I'm your second host, Dr. Payal Gupta, a board-certified allergy, asthma, and immunology doctor. Courtney and I hope to balance each other out so that we get you all the information that you want and need about allergies, asthma, and immunology. Welcome to 2020. 2019 was our first year and we can definitely say we've learned a lot. Yes, we learned a lot about everything that everyone wants to hear. And we also learned about how to edit. (laughs) So if you're a new listener, um, some of our earlier episodes might have a lot more ums and ahs, but we fix those as we moved along in the process. You can say that we are definitely refining our skills at podcasters and it's been a really fun process about learning about this medium and also learning a ton about allergies and asthma. So I'm excited because we have an awesome year planned for you guys from interviews about dating and drinking to deep dive episodes into immunodeficiencies and more about asthma and eczema treatments. To start off the new year, we decided it would be fun to bust some of those common food allergy myths that you guys have come up with. So what better way to start the new year than to be more informed about allergies, eh? Yep, I totally agree. And people ask some really good questions. So I think it's going to be a great way to start this new year of 2020. First myth is that only kids are affected by food allergies. Well, we do know that food allergies can start at any point in life. And although most food allergies do develop when you're a child, they can actually develop as an adult. And the most common food allergies that I see and that are common to develop as an adult are shellfish, both crustaceans and mollusks, and uh, tree nuts, peanuts, and fish. So again, although most adults with food allergies have had their allergies since they were children, you can develop a new food allergy as an adult. And um, what about soy? Because that's something that only popped up when I was older. Do you see adults developing soy allergy or is that just maybe my own story and not something that other people can relate to. So again, you know, you can develop any food allergen at any point in life, but the most common ones to develop are those, you know, tree nuts, shellfish, fish, and peanut. Those are the most common ones, but at any point you can have a new food allergy to anything. Uh, The next myth we have, and I think this is a really good one, is that each reaction is worse than the last. Allergic reactions are unfortunately unpredictable, which is why it's always important to be vigilant. It's really impossible to say what blood value or skin prick size will equate to in terms of an allergic reaction. And that's why allergists don't like to classify someone as being mildly or severely food allergic, because there's no way to really tell what might happen with the person's next reaction. But we do know that a reaction can be more severe if you eat food on an empty stomach, for example, if you're having really large quantities all at once, or if you eat it and then you exercise after because exercise increases blood flow. So you mentioned exercise can impact the severity of reaction. Now, I've read in a couple of places online that aspirin and alcohol can also increase your chance of having a stronger allergic reaction. Is that a myth or is that also true? So alcohol you know, can decrease the threshold level to trigger an allergic reaction, which means that a smaller amount of food can cause a larger reaction. And it can also decrease the time to develop an allergic reaction. But alcohol itself is an unlikely allergen. So as far as aspirin goes, it's not associated with worsening food allergies, reactions that we know of. However, we do know that people who have an underlying hive disorder, something called chronic urticaria, their hives might be made worse by aspirin. And so maybe people got confused about something that they read online about hives and aspirin and kind of 
you know, extrapolated it to foods, but we don't have any indications to say that food allergies are made worse by taking aspirin. This is why it's so good to bust these myths because things can kind of get blown out in proportion or we can confuse things. But just to recap, so aspirin, not necessarily for food allergies, but if you have other hive conditions, that might be something you see. But alcohol is definitely something you should keep in mind. And uh, I think that's good to know. And I have read that. And I generally like to avoid drinking alcohol if I'm going out to a new restaurant or if I feel like I'm in a situation that might encounter an allergen just because not only can it decrease your threshold, but I think it can also decrease your ability to make good sound judgments. So that's something to also keep in mind when you are thinking about drinking alcohol. So the next myth is, does the absence of a protein make an item or ingredient completely safe? And that's a really interesting question slash myth because things like oils come into play with this question. And I know that I have read and I have seen many hot debates about unrefined oils versus refined oils containing protein and you can eat it and you can't eat it. So let's jump into that idea of if there is no protein in the food, are you still allergic to it? Right. So theoretically, this is true. If there's no protein, there's nothing to be allergic to. So you need the food allergen protein to have a reaction. Food allergies occur when your body makes antibodies to protein in that food. So if you eat it and your body recognizes that protein, the body doesn't like it, the antibodies will attack it, causing an allergic reaction. So with oils, highly refined oils specifically are supposed to contain extremely small levels of allergenic protein, if any. So that's important to remember because the FDA has a legal document called the Food Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act of 2000. 2004. And specifically in regards to oils, they say that if it's a highly refined oil derived from any one of the eight major food allergens, then it doesn't require labeling for the food allergen because it's supposed to be highly refined and not supposed to contain any of the protein. So again, refined peanut oil is generally considered safe for most peanut allergic persons. And this is due to the fact that most, if not all of the protein is removed during the extraction process. However, peanut oil that is expeller pressed, extruded, or cold pressed does contain peanut protein and must be clearly listed on an ingredient label as peanut. So these types of peanut oil should be avoided by those with peanut allergy. And what was interesting was that according to an article that was put out on the college website, which we're going to link to, there have been studies into whether reactions occur in peanut sensitized individuals with exposure to refined peanut oil versus crude peanut oil. Okay, that's good to know. I feel like that is confusing because there are some oils that you can potentially have and some that you can't potentially have. Do you think it's best practice to just avoid it all or is it okay to try things? So I think it really depends on individual preference and you have to make sure that it is truly highly refined peanut oil that they're using. If you're going to have anxiety during your meal, then I think it's probably just best to avoid any kind of peanut oils or any kind of product that says it could contain a peanut oil. But as you saw, the study did show that it seems that refined oils are safe for people. For me personally, I choose to avoid refined oils. But I think, yeah, for other people, talk to your allergist about it and you can make your own informed choice. So the next myth, we've got a couple that surround the milk allergy. And the myth is that people with milk allergies will be fine with anything labeled lactose free. Yeah, so milk allergies are actually very serious, just like any other allergen. And so we really want to make sure that, of course, that the food allergen is taken seriously and that there is always the risk of anaphylaxis. And lactose free milk really does confuse people. Lactose free 
just means that the milk is recommended for people that are lactose intolerant. And that's a totally different thing from being allergic. Lactose intolerance just means that you're having trouble digesting lactose, which is a carbohydrate that's found in milk. And that leads to bloating, diarrhea, and just general uneasiness in the stomach. People will feel uncomfortable, but it's not the same thing as an anaphylactic reaction. And they don't have an allergy to milk protein. So when you have lactose-free milk, that just means that they take the lactose out, but there's still milk protein in that milk. Anybody with a milk protein allergy still needs to avoid lactose-free milk because it is cow's milk and it does contain cow's milk protein, which is dangerous for anybody that has a milk allergy. Yeah, that's good to remember. Just it's protein is where the allergy lies. Exactly. And the other milk allergy question we have is that everyone outgrows their milk allergy. Not true, unfortunately. So milk and eggs are more common in younger kids. And it's also more common to outgrow these two food allergen, but it's not always the case. And food allergies can persist, unfortunately. But what we do know is that kids who can tolerate baked egg or baked milk earlier tend to outgrow their allergy more often than those who can't tolerate baked eggs and milk. We'll jump on to another food group and the myth is you can have a reaction to airborne peanuts. Now back to the idea of protein is that I've read that peanut protein is too heavy to be airborne so that isn't possible. So how does the whole discussion around an airborne allergy function? Shellfish can be airborne because it's steamed and then it kind of ends up in the water particles, the protein. But with peanuts, unless you actually roast your own peanuts, it's extremely rare for it to be airborne. If you have peanuts that are in trail mix or peanut butter, you will not have anaphylaxis just from being next to someone or from even touching it. If you touch it, you might get a hive, so you would need to wash your hands well, but it wouldn't lead to an anaphylactic reaction. Should people not be worried about peanuts on planes? Right. So again, unless you eat it, it shouldn't affect you. So touching can cause local hives and reactions uh, just locally, right? Just like itching, hives, irritated skin, but it's unlikely to cause anaphylaxis. Unless you have a small child who likes to lick things and eat things off of the ground, it is unlikely that you will have a reaction to others eating peanuts on a flight a bus or even a train, right? Any any kind of vehicle. You can be next to someone or at a restaurant. You know, you can be in a space with your food allergen as long as you don't physically ingest it. Is it a myth then that you can have an anaphylactic reaction to touching an allergy? Or an allergen? Yes, it is a myth because for someone to have an anaphylactic reaction to a food that they only touch with their finger, with their skin, and that's, you know, we're, we're inferring that somebody has solid skin. If you have open areas like wounds and open skin where the food can actually get in an area where there's blood or anything like that, then that might cause a reaction. Without that and without swallowing any of the allergen, it's highly unlikely that you would have any further reactions. If you did, it would be exceptionally rare. And in most cases, just washing the area will stop the rash and it's likely that you won't even need any medication if you wash your hands. So again, you might have itching on your hands, but not anaphylaxis. So not any kind of difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, wheezing, chest tightness, vomiting, none of those should happen just from touching a food. And this brings up an important point though, touching the food can cause itching and hives. And for people who have had a previous anaphylactic reaction, those symptoms can cause a lot of anxiety. And so that anxiety itself can lead to the feeling of shortness of breath and chest tightness for some people. And that can be mistaken for an anaphylactic reaction. So it gets kind of confusing because the reaction itself can feel worse because of the emotions surrounding 
the initial symptoms, which is just the itching or irritation. I can definitely say that that's me. Uh, I have kind of a perfect story to illustrate that, actually. So a couple of weeks ago, I went out for dinner with my husband. Well, he had dinner and I went with him. And we went to a Korean restaurant. And I know that there are a lot of food allergens, my food allergens in that restaurant. We were completely alone in the restaurant. And he ate a meal that really had no none of my allergens in it. But because I was in this environment where I felt like they could be there airborne, I started getting really panicky and I felt like I was having a reaction. But I knew that it was just an association with the fact that I could be in contact with an allergen. But knowing that not ingesting it wouldn't give me a reaction was a really good peace of mind. So I could sit there with my husband and I could understand where this panic came from. And then as I sat there, it just disappeared. And I think that that's really powerful for you to know that you won't have an allergic reaction by just being in the same room with something or by even touching it if you have perfectly clean skin. So I think that that's a really good thing to remember and that it is easy to talk yourself into a panic, which could look like an allergic reaction, but it's not. And I think that when you see hives, it's also common to feel panicky about that because you're just waiting for another system to start going into reaction mode. But to remember that like you haven't eaten it, you've just touched it, that's important. And I think that gives you a lot of peace of mind as an allergy person. So just to recap, Touching a food cannot lead to anaphylaxis unless you put the hand that you touch the food in your mouth. And then maybe that's a different situation. Exactly. So if you're an adult, you wash your hands with soap and water and know not to put the allergen in your mouth. And then if you're a child, you know, that's when it gets a little bit wonky and, you know, everything goes in the mouth when you're a child. And so that's when it can get worrisome and you just have to be careful if an allergen is around that your child doesn't touch the food and then put the hand in the mouth. So I absolutely understand why parents parents get worried. But again, remember, just touching the allergen is not going to cause a reaction. I think that's like the best myth that's busted on our show so far. For me, that's given me a lot of peace of mind knowing that. Yeah. So the next question or the next myth is that you cannot be allergic to corn or rice. Corn and rice are not common food allergens, but they can cause allergies. And I have had patients who have had allergies to corn and rice. But again, they're not common food allergens, but any food can be an allergen. That's interesting because I remember hearing one time that someone was like, no, you can't be allergic to rice. So again, you can be allergic to almost every food, but there are just more common foods. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And the next question is, you cannot be anaphylactic to fruits or veggies. So again, all fruits have the ability to be allergenic foods, but fruits and vegetables are less common causes of actual food allergy. But for fruits and vegetables, what you can have is something called oral allergy syndrome, which is when your body is reacting to the pollen protein that can be found in some fruits and veggies. And that leads to just itching and irritation in the mouth, but very, very rarely anaphylaxis. So every case should be discussed with your doctor, but generally speaking, speaking, anaphylaxis is rare and most patients are not advised to carry an epinephrine device if they have oral allergy syndrome. And just to clarify, so foods caused by oral allergy syndrome are not considered a true allergen. Right. So they're not usually considered food allergies because you're not allergic to the predominant protein in the actual food. You're allergic to a small protein that's similar to a protein that's in the pollen that you're allergic to, and that's what your body is reacting to. So anaphylaxis is very, very, very rare. And if you do have anaphylaxis, then you probably need further testing to see if you do have a true allergy to that food and not just oral allergy syndrome. So again, oral allergy syndrome is not generally considered a true food allergy where most people do not get an epinephrine device for their oral allergy syndrome. Bringing up the point again, for people with other food allergies, however, 
oral allergy syndrome can cause a lot of anxiety because that itching and irritation in the mouth are usually signs and symptoms of possibly ingesting a true food allergen. So I do have a lot of patients who have other food allergies and then have oral allergy syndrome and they just choose to avoid fruits and vegetables that are raw altogether because of that concern. That's me. I'm a classic example of that. And uh, I think that is the best description of understanding OAS that I've ever heard. So thank you for that. I'm going to memorize that and then I'll use it my next dinner party. The next myth is an interesting one because when I was younger and naive, I didn't ever want to use my adrenaline auto injector since I thought it meant I would have to go to the hospital. And Basically, that was a roundabout way to get to the myth, which is if you use your EpiPen, you have to call 911 and go to the hospital. So it's always a good idea to seek medical care when you've had to use our epinephrine device. You always want to make sure that the person doesn't need an additional dose, that their blood pressure, their heart rate, everything is stable and that the symptoms are managed well. So I do usually recommend that they see a provider. Sometimes I tell them that if it's during office hours and their symptoms are truly stable, that they can even come to my office. Going to the ER or some kind of an urgent care center is always recommended, actually. And we'll also observe you to make sure that you don't have a delayed reaction, which is rare, but you could have a reaction that's delayed and you might need further treatment. Is that delayed reaction what they call a biphasic reaction? Yes. Again, it's rare, but a reaction that occurs after the initial reaction is called a biphasic reaction. This is more of a question that people wanted answered rather than a myth. And since we are talking about epinephrine, I thought I would just bring it up. And it's what would happen? happen if you do epi in the neck or chest like in the movies? Epinephrine should never go in the neck and chest like the movies. Epinephrine should go into a large muscle, which is the outer thigh. That's the best place in kids and adults. And if you inject it in the neck, you run the risk of puncturing really important blood vessels that could lead to an even worse outcome, like significant bleeding. It's supposed to go in a muscle and not supposed to go in the neck or chest. And so I'm really glad that more TV and movie producers are actually consulting doctors now to ensure that they aren't putting out inaccurate content in their shows. And if you had to use a second epinephrine auto injector, would you do it in the other thigh? No, you can do it in the same thigh. It's it's very unlikely that you're going to put it in the exact spot that you put the other injection. And I'm right handed. And when I've had reactions in the office and I've had to use epinephrine multiple times, I always end up going in the same thigh. So, yeah, you can do it in the same thigh. It doesn't matter. Okay, that's good to know because I've also seen that circulating on the internet. It's like you have to use different thighs if you use another auto injector. So if you use one, you have to use the second one and the other thigh. No. Oh, I'm very glad that we're busting all these myths because some of them I definitely thought were truths, especially like two EpiPens on the same thigh and also all of the mystery around OAS. I feel like it's just really nice to know that 2020, we're going to get more clarity and feel more confident in owning our allergies and in being able to talk about them in an informed and educated way. Yeah. And that's why I actually love getting questions from people that are listening because that's really what we're here for is to help demystify all of this stuff. So if there are any other questions, I think Courtney and I are both really, really excited and open to answering those questions. Please share them so that we can do more of these episodes. We can share them on our Instagram. We can just get that information out there so that these things that are on, you know, Dr. Google can get unbunked. Well, thank you so much. And I'm so excited to see what else 2020 brings us already going into it feeling a little bit more informed happy new year it's gonna be an exciting year i think for everybody thank you for listening to today's episode remember that all information you hear today is for informational purposes only and are not intended to serve as a substitute for the consultation diagnosis and or medical treatment of a qualified physician or healthcare provider 
And also don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. And if you have a second, help spread the word by rating our podcast and sharing with your friends and family who might also be interested in learning more about allergies, asthma, and immunology. You can always stay up to date by checking out our Instagram, The Itch Podcast, where you can leave questions you are itching to know or check out our website, which is www itchpodcast.com, which contains more information about the subjects we covered in today's episode and every episode. Until next time, have a fabulous week.